1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and go verse 1 to 5. And uh, <laughs> uh, if I put a title on this, because I always do when I start, but the thing I wrote in the corner is, title definitely needs work. <laughs> so this is the title I have, Extra Baggage Can Minimize People. Extra Baggage Can Minimize People. Or if I was to put another title, I'd say, Less Baggage, More People. Come along with me this morning. Um, look at this. They made it all uppercase for me and everything. They're trying to help me out here. Isn't that great of them? And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Who's this writing? Who's this speaking? This is Paul talking to us. Is there anyone in Scripture that had excellence of speech and writing? Oh my goodness, Paul wrote probably, what, a third of the entire Bible? He had excellency. He could have overwhelmed them with his theology and his understanding of God's Word. He chose not to. Really important you understand why he chose not to. Let me start again. Let me pray. Whenever I'm not sure, I just, this is a good time for me to stop and pray. Let's do it. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I am yours. Use me, work through me, flow through me. Lord, touch my body, touch my eyes. Let me function, Lord, as you designed. And Lord, let your power be seen and felt today. Let the word speak to our hearts. And mold and shape us. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Lord, once again, for your glory and for your honor. In your name, Jesus. Amen. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. Ooh. Demonstration of the Spirit and of the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom <laughs> of man. In the intellect of man. In the smarts of man. But in the power, in the power of Almighty God. Did you feel the power of God this morning? Man, if you didn't, you might want to check. Check yourself. Something's not quite right. If you didn't feel God's Spirit moving... Check your heart. Amen. Who moved? Come on. Let me read this in New Living Translation. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. I can't even imagine Paul weak, trembling, and trembling. This man was dynamic in every sense of the word. He was a powerful package of God who took on just about everything. In fact, every now and again, he'd stand before the Sanhedrin and the courts and the greatest of the day and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and tell them where things were. He stood up in front of a captain on his own ship and told him what he needed to do to save his ship. Paul wasn't timid, but he came that way in trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with were very plain. Rather than using clever messages, rather than using clever persuasive speech, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust 
not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Don't trust in human intellect. Don't trust in human wisdom. Don't trust in your thinking. Don't trust in our minds. The scripture says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death or destruction. Amen? We can get caught up in our thinking and miss the boat completely. Come on. And it's easy to do. And the problem about deception, you don't know you're deceived. You don't realize, see, it wouldn't be deception if you knew you were deceived. You go, oh, that's dumb. But I've seen people argue causes and cases and plans and ideas, and they were so wrong. But in their minds, they were so right and taking it to the, to the very edge of walking away from the very Lord that they served their life for. Come on! There's a way that seemeth right. Let me tell you why what this story is kind of, or this message is kind of birthed off of. Years ago, Kath and I had considered the challenge of taking on a young mission team uh, into an outreach of another country. We'd had the experience ourselves so many times, we thought it was the best thing to grow God's people. And by the way, I still believe that. A mission team is a powerful experience. Why? Because you see other cultures and other ways of worshiping and you come to realize, oh, it's okay. Oh, it's not wrong. We visited one church. We visited one church in, in Hungary. And when the service was over, what'd they do? They all got up and danced. Well, of course, being the stick of the mud from the America that we were, we all stood there and watched him. I just, me, we didn't. We jumped right in him. <laughs> of course, we're not good at it because we into that couple of days, I was going, this is fun. <laughs> this is a good way to end church. Woohoo! It was something they did every single time. And you know why they did it? Because it got them closer to everyone because you had to take their hand. You had to, no, I'm not going to make you dance, baby. She just went, whoa, 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 young man. You had to take their hand. And part of the dance was, look around you. This is God's people. Do you see someone that needs some love? See, we come to church and we look around and see somebody that needs picking on. Oh, I quit preaching and went right straight to meddling this morning. Come on, church. We're about supporting one another and lifting up one another and picking up one another. And I love what Paul said. Stop showing me your Christian foo-foo. And get down to the basics. Hmm. Stop showing off your eloquent words. Oh man, we can all say eschatology and we can all... What's the point if the average person in the chair doesn't understand it? So I do my best so that the, the, the school kid in our church can understand what I'm saying. And that's what Paul was saying. Oh, you bunch of Greeks, I could wow you with my intellect, but I chose for you to feel the power of God and hear the message because that's more important. Amen? Think about it when you're sharing. Stop speaking Christian ease. Hello. If we're trying to minister to somebody that's not a Christian, we need to stop using words they don't understand. Amen? Come on, church. Get it down to their level. Talk in their world. That's the neat thing about going to another country is you have to realize, I've got to communicate to them somehow. How do I do this? Anyway, Kath and I thought about we're doing a mission team. And we had one set up. We were all set up to run a mission team to, to the Philippines. 
Uh, Billy Wilson was the one who was in charge of it, and he was orchestrating it, and we were going to run the team. And we were all set, and then he showed up. Don't get me wrong, he was prayed for dearly, and we're very grateful for him. In fact, his name means priceless, because to us it was a treasure. And I was glad to step aside from that mission trip and say, we'll get another one. But as I read about mission trips, I read about a mission trip to Alaska. And I thought, Alaska? That's not even outside of this country. How's that a mission? Over 20% suicide rate in teenagers. It more than triples the highest problem in anywhere else in our nation. Folks, that's a mission endeavor. And I realized it real quick, so I started reading about this. And get this, this is what birthed this message, okay? What got me going on it. In <laughs> now I'm swallowing my tongue. <laughs> To get into these mission endeavors and these area of churches, you literally had to go at times 400 miles past, past the nearest road. You hearing me? We're talking, you guys think you're out in the country, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking out in the sticks. 400 miles past the nearest road. What does that mean? That means you're going by a prop plane, a fishing plane, a fishing boat, you're going in there hardcore to come in. And the reason I brought this point out is because what you realized real quickly and what the article emphasized was you had to reduce a package that you were going to live on for five weeks down to 15 to 20 pounds. Oh, now listen to what I'm saying, Rachel. This will tickle your little heart, huh? To go to Europe and go to Slavic countries, we had to get under 50 pounds. We could do, and I did, 49.5. But that was the most you could have. If you went over it, they would open your suitcase and start throwing stuff out. And if you let them do it, they would do it quickly. You just might not like their choices. So you made sure you had it under 50 pounds. Now talk 15 to 20. And folks, we were living on one week at a time, then we'd get everything all laundered, do it all over again, and take off for another week. It was a two-week trip. This is five weeks. Less than 20 pounds. Brother Miller, surely you're not telling us this because this is part of the message. Oh, but it is. You see, the reduced size of the baggage meant more people that could sit in the seats and go on the mission trip. And your goal was to have a person in every one of the seats not filled with baggage. Speak to us, church. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. It's pure. It's not complex. It's so that the simple person, as well as the intellect, can be impressed with it and get it and plug in but we, in our absent-mindedness, in our humanness, in our sense of religion, have put baggage on God's gospel. And our baggage is reducing the number of people that can come. Woo! Man, I can't believe he came out and said that. Isn't it true? Baggage hinders baggage hinders if it's not for the intent of getting you through this article got me thinking so much everybody you say oh pastor you just want people you want numbers yes you're right i do soul 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 the airline gets it better than we do, church. They have a manifest about who's on board, and they'll tell you. We have 53 souls a day. They don't even preach to them, and they have souls there. Do 
Numbers, to me, represent souls we can touch for eternity. So I want more souls in the seat. Amen? I want more souls in the seat. I always want more souls in the seat. You fill this house up, I'm going to want more souls in the seat. I'm just a little crazy that way. You know why I'm crazy that way? Because of what Jesus did for me. Because he changed me so completely and gave me a brand new life and a brand new start. Man, I was a mess. You need to know I was a mess. But he gave me a brand new start. I told him, Lord, if you'll help me do this, I will help as many people as I can get to heaven. Well, here I am, still trying to fill churches with souls. Souls that hear the message. Teams move faster and farther on less baggage. Amen? Churches move faster and farther and are more effective by less baggage. So the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the apostle Paul so powerfully said, I don't dazzle the crowd with my intellect and my abilities. I try to get down to the basics. I kept the message simple. I keep it something they can interact with. You need to understand, church, not everybody is going to like me and my style of preaching. I get that. That's why God made a Scotty. That's why God made a Cody. That's why God made a, a look. All these different speakers around this building. That's why God has them here. Because they'll reach people I won't reach. Well, they're not as good. Oh, don't go down that road. They'll reach people I won't reach. Scotty, you will touch lives I will never touch. And thank God for it. Now, I, I think you need to work on your style and be more like me, but... <laughs> See, that's the nonsense of our thinking. We want people to be more like us. I got to tell you, we're not all that in a bag of chips. And we forget how long it took us to get to that point. We forget we've been here for a lot of years. A lot of years growing and developing. But we see somebody and we want to start adjusting them before they even find Jesus Christ. Ooh, this must not be on because I know they'd be amen in that. Come on, church. If we're not careful, we're trying to fix people before they even find the fixer. We're trying to heal them before they become acquainted with the one that heals. Amen. Let me read it to you again. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom. As I proclaimed to you the testimony of, for God or about God. For I resolved not to know, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I wanted to talk about. That's all he wanted to preach about. That's all. I love Sam Clemens. He was a blessing to me for many, many years. One of the most dynamic preachers in our church. Whether you liked his style or his management or his administrative, that's not the point. He was a great man of God. Still is, by the way. Excuse me, didn't make him sound like he was deceased. He's not. And man, he could hit points like nobody's business. And I loved his preaching style. But he had a great way of taking the most complex and bringing it down to simply understanding God's word and truth. But he said to me one day as we were talking, we were in Idaho and I was showing some of the area in Idaho and he said, I look back over my ministry, and of course at this time he was talking years and years and years of ministry, and he said, if I was to do anything different, more Jesus Christ, and less of some of this other stuff. More Jesus Christ and him crucified, because that's the whole key of it. Man, that just triggered something in my heart and saying, yeah, that is it. That's what it's about. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs> now, with all of Paul could have done, his intellect, his ability, his understanding, he decided to get rid of all the uncomplicated, all the encumbering, all the foo-foos, 
of doctrine and words and sp let's get down to the simplicity of finding Jesus Christ remember that the next time you talk with somebody lose the Christianese lose the different language use the sayings stop with the cliches come on Christians we have them we bury each other in them constantly they don't mean a thing to the unsaved Yesterday, I went into the bathroom. I'm sorry. I have to tell you this. It was too funny. <laughs> Somebody going, now where is he going? <laughs> I went into the bathroom. Now, men, verify this. Men do not speak in the bathroom. You do not converse when you go into the bathroom. Ladies, you go in there and you chat. You even put couches and lounges in bathrooms. So weird. Men, we got business to do and we're out. We don't talk to anyone. And I walk in the door and there's a worker in the bathroom cleaning up the bathroom. And he says, how are you doing today? He just violated the number one rule. He talked to me and I'm going, huh? I said, well, I'm doing great. How about you? Now I violated the rule. I asked him to engage. And he said, I'm doing horrible. I said, now, Lord, you know I got to do business. But I can't pass that up. And I said, man, what if I could tell you a way so you wouldn't be doing horrible? He said, what's that way? What's that all about? No, he said, what y'all talking about? That's what he said. <laughs> and I said, I'm talking about a man named Jesus that can fix everything in your life. Oh, he got real busy. Real quick. Suddenly, he put the policy back into place. We don't talk in here. But I shared with him the example that Jesus is the answer. And as I was going out of the bathroom, again, violating policy number one, I said, he can make everything in your world better like he did with mine. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. And I walked out the door because I knew he we weren't going to talk anymore. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. What was it about? Oh, man, I took him down the Romans road to salvation. I did the SEL program and took him through this. No, I told him there's an answer for how horrible you're feeling. And the answer's name is Jesus. You don't got to get complicated with people. They want the answer. Amen? They want a simple answer. Church, I believe we need to uncomplicate and simplify the gospel. Bring it back to the simple thing. Baggage is like rituals, rules, traditions, history. Do we let history become traditions and rules? Well, we've always done it this way. Oh, Lord, I wish I had a quarter for every time I've wanted to poke that one right in the... Well, guess what? We're not doing it this time that way. Did that make it right? Well, like we've always done it that way. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't even necessarily make it good. It just makes it history. And we all know we need to learn from history or history will repeat itself and oftentimes bite us badly. Amen, Pastor Miller. How about that? That's baggage? It sure can be. Your history can be your baggage. How about religion? Ooh, there's a dirty word. Why is religion a dirty word? I had a girl come up to me, and I had talked with her a little bit. 
And she said, she said, after I talked with her just a little bit, it was at the airport. In fact, it was one of those times I came over here. And it's the airport, and she said, oh, you're one of those religious ones. And I said, oh, no, no, I am not religious. I said, but I am a Christian. She said, what's the difference? I said, about 18 inches. Religion, Christianity. About 18 inches, but it's a world of difference. And I said, people get hung up on religion, and it turns into baggage. Baggage that we have to cling to. And by the way, you know the biggest problem to Christianity in the world today? Religion. Let me take it a step farther. You want to know the biggest problem in the world today? Biggest problem. It's not Donald Trump. It's not Biden. It's not even Netanyahu. You know what the biggest problem in the world today is? Religion. You know why? Because it's man-made. Religion is man-made. Christianity is servanthood is God made and it's a huge difference and religion note our history in the world how many wars have been fought over religion how many battles have been fought over religion what's going on in Israel right now because of religion they've got the Palestinians coming after them and trying to do all kinds of damage and Israel's saying no more no more we're done with all that by the way, support Israel wherever you can. That's a good thing. Those are still God's people. Amen, Pastor? I know I don't like all the things that are happening, but I'm telling you, they're fed up. And they're tired of saying, we're going to push you into the ocean. <laughs> they're tired of hearing that. They've heard it for years and years and years. And oh, by the way, there's a day coming where they're going to stand up and take on the world. Oh, by the way, I'm not so sure we'll even be there. Come on, we're the USA, Pastor! Where is it in Scripture? Not there. There's some reason we've lost power. Oh, man, some of you are looking at me. Oh, wow, we need to preach that one right now. Someday I will. It'll preach. You need to understand there's a day coming. God's going to do something special for Israel. And I'm telling you, it'll be phenomenal. You think the six-day war was awesome? You ain't seen nothing like what God's going to do in that. However, I'm telling the Lord, warm my seat up. I'm hoping to have a different vantage point by then. Amen. <laughs> All these can obscure the real issue. All these things can be baggage that stop people from coming to the real issue. What's the real issue? A genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we want. You see, I want to tell this person about Jesus, but what do I do with that nose ring? Can, can you take that out so you can come to Jesus? What about all those tats and all those piercings? That doesn't work in my Bible. Show me where. It doesn't work in your mind. Hello? Baggage. Come on, church. Why don't we let them find Jesus Christ and fall in love with him before and let him do the cleaning? You know what was the greatest deliverance of this preacher's life? Well, of course, when Jesus saved you. Yes, you know what number two was? No, don't bring my wife into it. She's the greatest thing in my life, no question about it. But the greatest thing as a pastor was when I came to grips with, I don't have to fix you. You know what the greatest thing will be in your marriage? 
when you come to grips with you don't have to fix her and she doesn't have to fix you. And by the way, <laughs> you can't fix anybody but you. And I can't fix anybody but me. I'm here to tell you about the power of Jesus Christ to fix everything. But I can't fix you. I don't have to fix anyone. I don't have to make them look like me or act like me or talk like me. And I'm thinking that's some of our baggage. We want people to be little old ladies. And they're 23 years old. Have you got your nun outfit on yet? Come on, honey. We want to see you conservative. That way we know God's in you. That's baggage. And it's your baggage. And you're putting your baggage on the gospel of Jesus Christ that simply says, just love Jesus. Can you do that? Oh, I like that about you. Just love Jesus. See, if we can convince people to love Jesus and fall in love with Jesus, some of this stuff will all kind of go away by itself. And some of it will start realizing it's really not important that the hair is purple, pink, and orange all on the undersides. Woo! Who cares? Where's this at? Where's this at? Oh, Lord, help us with our baggage issues. Huh? Do we have baggage issues? I'm afraid we do, church. I'm afraid we do. And we really got to ask God to help us. We're trying to clean them up before they learn and meet the cleaner upper. Who's the one that cleaned you up? See, who, who cleaned you up, man? Your wife did, right? Certainly she scrubbed dub dubbed and got you the man you are today. <laughs> and she's going, I gave up. <laughs> ah, it doesn't work that way. Now, don't get me wrong. Iron does sharpen iron, and we rub on each other. Don't get aggressive with that rubbing. Uh, somebody scolded somebody the other day and said, I'm rubbing on them. No, 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 you're beating on them. There's a difference. Iron rubs against iron, and we make each other better because this woman has made me such a better man. Not because she gets after me. Not because she scolds me. Not because she tells me how to do that or this. Right? But she does. <laughs> Now, she doesn't do that, but she loves me. And her love for me just keeps praying for me. Oh, God, please just get him right. And for years, she just keeps praying for me. Isn't that what the Bible says for us to do? Pray for one another? Care about one another? Look after one another in prayer, not in judgment. Man, I don't think you should have worn that shirt today. Wow. That's just ultra conservative. I hate ultra conservatives. That's none of my business. And you know I'm not serious. Come on. We're baggage issues. God, help us. It's also tempting to load down the story of Jesus with the baggage of our own experiences. Oh, some of you are looking, now where is he going? Well, when I went down and got saved, I bawled and I squalled and I had a mess all over the altar. And if you really get saved, you'll do the same. That's baggage. You don't have to bawl and squall. You might. You probably want to. And you might make a mess. That's why we have Kleenex all over the altars. 
that doesn't make it holy to do it the way you did it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I hope this kind of settles. Oh, man, who took the clock and made that weird thing happen there? My mama, I love my mama to death. She's the sweetest woman that ever was. Most godly woman I believe I've ever met. And I don't say that just because that's my mama. I say that because this woman was up praying for me in the middle of the night. Why? Because I was the one unsaved, backslidden, yay hoot in our family. I was the only one. So I challenged my mama's prayer life constantly. She was up for the challenge. I can't tell you how many nights I got up to go to the restroom and come in the living room and hear my mama crying to God. That woman could pray. I'm here today because she knew how to pray. She was a dynamic woman of God. She was an outstanding pastor's wife and she was an outstanding preacher. She could flat tear it up. Sometimes she'd shear a little bit of sheepskin off, but she could flat out get it to the core great woman of God. But here's what happened. And I watched this up close and personal. When my dad died, our church went through a crisis. Now you have to understand, our church was dynamically filled with the Spirit. We had a revival going on for, for years, not weeks. We just never got out of a state of revival. And my dad died of cancer. It was horrible timing on his part. I can say that now because it's been a lot of years. I started monitoring services. The last thing my dad did before he died was set me forth as a lay minister. One of his last official acts of business. But when he died, it was like somebody flipped the switch on my mom's ministry. She sat there in a congregation she had loved and worked with, but she no longer had a purpose because she was no longer the pastor's wife. There was another one. And she sat there trying to figure out how it would work. And bless her heart, my mama was a great song leader. You know, back in the day where we actually had song leaders that one person got up, took out the blue book, and we read the songs from the, and that one person led the word. You remember, before we had worship teams and got all really good with the fun. Don't get me wrong, I love worship teams. I think they're essential. But back in the day, we used to do it. Because the Holy Ghost had blessed so phenomenally. Sister Anna, you can relate to this because you know what it's like Sunday after Sunday seeking God for the right song. The right song that's going to help God's people come to you. She does it endlessly. God, every now and again, you just need to go up and tell her, I appreciate you, lady. I appreciate you, Isaac, and you people on the worship team that do that. But here's what happened with my mom. The Holy Ghost had blessed when we sang this song, this song, and this song. And it seemed to always rain down. You know, there's some that are our Fab Five, our few songs that we know will bring the house in. We just know worship's going to ensue, right? You know what I'm talking about. She fell in love with them. And every Sunday sang those same songs. Now, like Paul, she had a repertoire she could have went to, but instead, she sang those same songs, thinking that was the formula to bring the house back to God. Because in her desire to get the church strong again, she literally was hurting the church with a way in her mind. And you say, well, I would never do anything like that. Oh, you do it already. Because you put baggage upon the worship team that's here now. And you ask them to sing like the songs we used to sing, or the worship team that used to be, 
or the way we used to do things. That's baggage. I can't make them into something that once was. Neither will I ever be something that once was. We're going ahead with something that now is. And God will bless us if we let go of baggage. You see, we can't put yokes on people and expect them to respond. We have to set them free and say, follow Christ the best way you can. And if you need to wear that goofy outfit, then bless God, wear it, and I'm going to love you. Amen? That's when we stop with baggage. There's a, there's a movie, and I'm not going to get into it, but the movie is about a church that's trying to have transition out of the old and into the new. And the, and the people that are coming are young people and folks, they didn't wear shoes and they're rough looking and they did things that would make everybody go, oh Lord. And of course, one of the things they did is on Sunday, they'd come down and sit down in the front and because they'd worship. Ooh, they got into worship. You know what? If you really like worship, you'll get down here. Young people, you guys want to fill this up down here when it's worship time? I'll be right there with you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. To feel worship and just let it come out. And every now and again, it might let your feet just get a little loose. Yeah, you won't want me dancing near you. <laughs> and as this, as this movie goes on, they're nudging. Oh, look at here comes Deacon Bob. Deacon Bob's going to get him. He's going to fix their problem. And he went down and sat down with them and started worshiping. Ooh, what a godly deacon. Ooh, that was a good deacon. Man, when I saw that, I went, good move, man. That's awesome. Way to respond. He didn't put baggage on them. He set them free to worship the best way they could. Isn't that what we need to do with God's people? Set them free to worship the best way. You know what I know about God's people? They're good people. Their heart's right. God's voice will speak to them. And eventually they'll fix some of those things. I don't have to worry about it. So you can come and tell me about all their problems and how you need to fix it. I had somebody recently point on a, on a mailing list of somebody and said, you need to fix that. And I looked him and smiled and said, no, I don't. Not my job. This is not Bob the mechanic. This is Bob the pastor who loves people right where they're at until God can bring you to where you need to be. And he will. Oh, I'll tell you if you ask me. But the fact is, it's not my job to fix. So I politely said, however, you can always go and love on them because that's what they need. Oh, man, all these scribblings, and it all came down to that. Let me share this, and, and I'll close with these thoughts. If a person who recently comes to Christ stumbles over Jesus on the cross, then we'll love them. But then it's kind of on them, isn't it? That's their issue and choice. But if they stumble over our baggage that we added to Jesus Christ in the cross, then it's on us. And it could have eternal weight. Are you hearing me? It could have eternal weight. Oh, Lord, shame on us if anyone stumbles over our baggage. The church, you have to look back in history and realize people in our past have stumbled over our baggage. I'm sorry. We'd like to think we're squeaky clean, but we have baggage. God's helping us get free from it, but we've had problems. God needs to help us go back to the simplicity that is the gospel. What's the gospel? What is the gospel? 
It's the good news that Jesus died for your sins. And because he died, you don't have to pay the price. That's all that counts. You can talk about eternity? Yes. You can talk about benefits? Yes. But stop talking rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. Tell them about Jesus who loves them just the way they are. Mm. Guys, can you get 1 Corinthians 8, the first chapter? 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Sorry, I didn't give you any advance notice for that. I'm just always trying to test Isaac, see if he can handle it. It's my job. It's one of the perks of my job, anyway. <laughs> first Corinthians, the first chapter, verses, I think, like 18 through 20, somewhere in there, 18 through 21. 18 through 21. I like it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. The message of the cross. I'm going to read this in New Living Translation. Oh, they did it too. Oh, you guys are good. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are blessed are being saved. Excuse me. We who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Verse 19. As the scripture said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intellect of the intelligent verse 20 so where does this leave the philosopher and the scholars and the world's brilliant brilliant debaters god has made the wisdom of the world look foolish foolish since god in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used, what? The foolishness of preaching. <laughs> I love this passage and nobody ever seems to enjoy it near as much as I do. He chooses to use the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Now, whether you like it or not, he thinks I'm important. The foolishness of crazy preachers. Oh, I added the crazy in there because we all are. Just a little bit. But God uses our personality to reach hearts and lives. What is the gospel? It's very simple. But now I need to present the gospel and relate to you personally so it means something to you. Amen? Cody, you're going to reach people I'll never touch, man. Because you'll bring the gospel out in a fresh that will bring life to them and encourage them. And that's why it's so important. Your ministry is such a critical part to this church. The foolishness of preaching. Don't get offended. He called your preaching foolish. I don't take it offensively. I take it that God says, Paul, get the glory in it, not you, big guy. Paul, get the glory in it. It won't ever come to you. Amen? So that God gets the glory. So how about this? How about we simply stick to Jesus and the cross and the simplicity of the gospel? How about we focus on that instead of all these other things? Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used the foolish preaching to save those who believe. The point is clear this morning to us. And I'm sorry it took me so long to share it with you. But hopefully you get it. God help us let go of baggage. 
God, help us to reduce the baggage and not allow ourselves to be one of those servants that always is trying to put our baggage or our way on somebody else. It doesn't have to be our way. Let it be their way. And let God move their heart to where he wants them to be. Because guess what? They may reach people you'll never reach because they did it their way. Pray with me this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for these good hearts. These great hearts that are in this room. Lord, they're faithful to you. They're faithful to your word and what it means. And Lord, I ask that you just bless and help them. God, you help them with love. You help them with mercy. That you help them with the great grace, Lord, that you've provided for us. Help us, Lord, to share it with others. Teach us the power, Lord, of getting rid of the baggage and just focusing on the importance of the gospel. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for what it means to our hearts. And I thank you, Lord, for your love that goes from everlasting to everlasting to all mankind and to all that will believe. Lord, let us don't be those people that stop those that believe from having that experience or hindering their walk. God, we want to be faithful to bringing whosoever will, because that's you said was important. Guide our hearts, Lord, I pray.